Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're doing the very highly requested hugaculture. If I am sorry if I pronounce that poorly, I'm not proficient in German, but we're going over hugaculture, whether it's worth it, what is happening in those systems, kind of the science behind whether or not it's a benefit or a not benefit and what systems it would work in, what soil types it works for, what soil types it wouldn't work for and all that fun stuff. If you guys didn't notice, I am running rapid on all the different types of gardening and soil prep and soil science stuff because I'm trying to give you guys as much information as I possibly can so that when the gardening season starts, you can start making plans for your garden bed and your soil prep to make a decision as to what you want to do this year. Don't worry. I will get into seeds and seed starting, but not yet Canadians. Hold your horses. We gotta wait. I promise I will tell you based on your zone when it is time to start thinking about getting ready. I am a firm believer that smaller plants transplant better and that waiting is much healthier for both the plant and your sanity than starting early and having giant plants that really desperately need to get outside and are got a sick lean to them so when it comes to transplanting transplant shock plants do better when they're bee buzz and they go outside so don't get excited i won't leave you hanging so anyone who has not heard about hug culture it is a mound that is either placed on top of a soil surface or a trench is dug to place the mound inside of or you can do a raised bed system that has the wood and kind of like all the different layers that is then encompassed by some sort of raised bed setup. All of these are hogaculture. There's no difference in any of them. The initial purpose for the hogaculture setup was actually to, I actually read the original paper. I have to read verbatim what it said. So the initial paper that talked about this was that it was developed for poisoned layers of soil. Yep. It was a way to separate in ancient minds or older folks' minds, um, not even ancient, this isn't that old of a method, but it was a way to separate poisoned soil or poor quality soil from the growing medium that we grow our plants on. I'm gonna tell you one thing. If your soil is poisoned, do not do hugaculture on top of it. Don't put anything on top of it. You should not be eating poisoned food, food from poisoned soil. Not a good idea. You need to like call a reclamation team. Do not do it. That is so unhealthy. Trust me, the roots are going to get to that poison soil. Blah. But it was also developed and heavily used at a time when burning wood was considered illegal. So the only way that people had to dispose of their logs and their, their tree bits was to put them underground or put them into a hogaculture setup. So that's kind of neat as well. But now hogaculture is like the ultimate a uh, hippie way of gardening. So it's like kind of trendy. The size of a log that you put in the bottom is what's going to determine the lifespan of your hugaculture setup. So I'll insert a photo of exactly what this looks like, but the logs that are in the center or at the bottom of the setup, the thickness of that is going to determine how long this whole getup lasts for. Now, if you put like little tiny twigs and branches, you're probably only gonna get like three years out of it. If you're in a warmer climate, you might get more if you're in a colder climate, like in Canada, you may get five, six, seven years, especially if you have winter. Um, but if you have larger size logs, you may get like seven or eight years. So it all kind of depends on the initial log diameter. One thing that I don't hear a lot of hug culture people talk about, but it's something to note, if the logs haven't been 
aged before being put into the hookah culture setup. So say you chop a tree down and that same year you decide to use that tree in a hookah culture setup. If the tree is less than I'd say even three years old, you will have some nutrient bank. <laughs> like it'll be, it'll be really tied up inside of that wood. And I can go into uh, why that is in a separate video, but essentially what's going on is that the carbon that the microbes need to decompose that wood is tied up in the microorganisms that are then using the that fuel to decompose the wood. That means that the soil itself isn't going to have as much nutrient turnover in very simple terms. So that is something to think about if you're doing this setup is that you wanna make sure that your logs are properly aged. One thing that is most important when you're doing the setup is you want to pack this in as tight as possible. So as you have all the different layers, so you have your wood layer and then you have your leaf litter, soil compost manure layer, and then you have maybe like a topsoil compost manure layer, and then you have a mulch layer. You wanna make sure it's all packed in really tightly. If there's any sort of gaps or large air pocket areas, you'll have a few things happen. You won't have as much of a sponge effect to prevent against drought, but you also will have dead spots. So roots don't like air. It's the reason why when you have a pot, for example, in the garden center and you're going to get your wave petunias, you'll notice that they never come out the holes on the bottom. They always kind of just spiral and do weird things inside the container. That's because their roots, if they go outside the container, generally, so long as there's not a cover pot on it, they will completely die off. Um, they they dry out way too quickly. So we want to prevent against those air pockets in a hoe culture setup by really packing it together. Do not be shy, trust me. There's no such thing as hard pattern compaction when it comes to this setup. Because there's so much wood and mulch and leaf litter layer in this and not so much, there's not a ton of soil when you're looking at the whole scope of the whole getup. I would suspect microbially there's a very high level of fungi and a low level of bacteria. So there's a slight microbe imbalance there um, to help alleviate that. I guess you could inoculate with some bacteria, but it's not a huge deal. It's just something to keep in mind. Some issues with the Hogu Hulter setup besides the nutrient sink, the carbon sink with the undecomposed wood. I can also see issues with a perched water table, especially if you put it in poisoned soil. So if you have it on a clay platform or on a, any sort of platform and the depth isn't enough, you may end up with a perched water table, which can result in root rot. Also the changes, if it's in a raised bed setup or if it's in a recessed uh, soil setup and it's not an actual mound, I can see perched water tables in between each of the layers because there's such a change there. So that may end up being an issue as well. I find the presentation of it to be very ugly. I don't like the look of it. I find it very messy looking. But if you're in the permaculture and a natural look, then obviously this is right up your alley. There's one uh, soil scientist that I actually really, really respect. Her name's Dr. Linda Chalk Scott, Chalk Scott, and she's from the Washington University. And she was quoted saying this about the hugaculture method. Both Andra and Biba promoted hugaculture as a method based on biological principles. It's unclear, however, what these biological principles are. None are described in the brochure and there are no references. In fact, this method is at odds with the ecological prevent principles behind building soil through litterfall. So what she is referring to when she's critiquing the brochure and the kind of the book behind this whole idea is that the packing on, the soaking, the 
all the different layers and the fact that the wood is in the center and not on the outside where it's exposed to air and sun and wind and all these mechanical factors that help break down that wood into a mulch eventually. Um, because it's in the center of the system where it very well could turn anaerobic, it goes completely against the science. So she's referring to the fact that because it's in an anaerobic environment, that there's no sun and no ability for that mechanically, those large logs to be manipulated, that it may cause acidic and anti microbial environments, which I can see happening, especially if we end up with all these, you know, perch water tables and areas that are, you know, void of soil that have lots of, like, it can get messy if it's not built properly. Personally, I wouldn't use it. Um, I think I would probably recommend it to someone that had a heavy clay soil but if someone had a heavy clay soil, I'd honestly probably recommend the CD uh, no dig garden first and foremost. I don't like the mounding idea. I think that if you um, you trenched it, depending on the soil type you trenched it in, you could end up with an actual bathtub situation, which could get anaerobic and acidic very quickly. And the raised bed setup, I like a bit more, but the only problem is that if you put it in a raised bed setup, because you have so much decomposition and high fungal counts that you may end up decomposing your raised bed at the same time. So is it worth the money? I don't know. You guys have to let me know if you've used this agriculture setup. I'd be interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. I was just combing the internet to see first years with agriculture if it worked if it didn't there's quite a few people that it really didn't work for and that may be because they didn't use enough soil i'm not entirely sure but there was other ones on there that said that they only watered once the entire year and then the rest was just natural processes so i do believe that because if you had rotted logs like that would be holding a ton of water so I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of this one. Not, it's just not for me, but it may be for some people. I hope this video helped you out. Hopefully it led you in the right direction as to whether or not you want to try this out. I'm not against it. I'm not for it, but I'm not against it either. I just want to give you guys the tools to make the best decisions for your sales. If you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. Let me know in the comments if you use this method. I'd be interested to know how it's worked out for you. And the next video we're doing is going to be the deep till method. Or no, the deep mulch, deep till, pff, deep mulch method. Because that is the other one that you guys have highly requested. If there's any sort of other gardening soil setups that you would like me to look at, please let me know in the comments and I will be sure to get to it. I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.